name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I remember when I was in college and taking one of my psychology classes that the professor said that our strongest sense associated with memory is smell. In fact, he said, if we had something that was a very unique smell, uh, at least to us, uh, that we had permeating while we studied for an exam, and we were able to somehow get that same smell going while we took the exam, uh, that our grades would improve. I never tested that theory, but it makes sense, because when you think of certain smells, they send you reeling to places almost as concretely as if you travel through time. I can tell you, when I get out of the car in Vermont and I take a deep breath, even before my feet hit the ground, I'm there. And I'm not just there in the present moment. I'm there as a child jumping in the lake. Uh, the same is true for the salt air at the beach. Or when you uh, go to the uh, Christmas tree farm and you smell the pine, it sends you reeling back to Christmas's past. Uh, and how many of you have some smell, uh, some perfume, or, or some uh, fruit, or something that's being baked that sends you to a moment in your, your, your history? Uh, it's not just connected to our memory, it's connected to the emotional part of our memory. Uh, this actually worked to folly one time. Uh, about 15 years ago, I think, we were at a Persian restaurant in Louisville, uh, and it was recommended to us to try rose uh, water ice cream, which I found delicious. My wife felt like it smelled just like her recently deceased 103-year-old grandmother <laughs> and couldn't get away from her grandmother's drawers in order to enjoy the uh, rose water ice cream. But, uh, uh, but the connection is real and it's tangible. And this may be the most pungent gospel that we have. All right, maybe the fig tree and the manure might be a close second, but this is one of the most pungent. Uh, and, and the smell's important, so hold on to that. But this is a gospel about excessiveness. It's another prodigal gospel. It's about extravagance. It's about lavishness heaped upon somebody, just the way that we talked about last week with the story of the prodigal. This week, it's heaped upon Jesus himself. Just at the beginning of the last chapter of John, Jesus has been to Bethany which is a suburb of Jerusalem, and he went knowing that what he was about to do would be his death nail. He went to raise his beloved friend Lazarus from the dead. And he knew that Lazarus' raising would be the beginning of his descent to death. The powers that be could not hold in their realm somebody who had the power to lift people from the dead. And it turns out that he was right. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, the, the later part of that chapter, right after that happened, the council of, of the Jewish leaders get together and they say, Rome is going to sack us. They're going to hear about this. They're going to hear about all the people that are following Jesus, and they're going to come and they're going to destroy our religious sites. They're going to squash out our religion. They're going to kill thousands and thousands uh, of our faithful, and we've got to do something. And they said, you know, is it is it better to have one man die so that, uh, so that all the rest can be preserved? What choice has he given us? He's the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. That's the conversation that starts before this gospel. And then Jesus kind of keeps a low profile for a while, but it's Passover. Passover is getting ready to start, and people are asking, isn't Jesus going to show up at Jerusalem? Of course he is. And Jesus knows he has to go. So Jesus begins walking towards Jerusalem, and he stops by his beloved friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus just recovering from being raised from the dead. And they stop for dinner. Maybe one last respite before that march to Jerusalem. And so they're preparing a meal and Mary disappears, as she often does. She seems to be in her own world. And Martha's probably uh, grumbling to herself, where did Mary go this time? And if I were to be truly honest with myself, Mary would drive me nuts. 
I mean, she really would. As much as she understands God, it definitely exposes something in me that I realized that Mary would be my undoing if I had to work with her. Uh, but she understands Jesus in a profound way. And Jesus needs it, needs that. I think this is one of the few Gospels where Jesus gets what he desperately needs. How many times has Jesus told people, I'm going to have to die? This is leading to the cross. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for what comes after the cross? And the disciples try to shut him up as quickly as they can. They try to change the conversation. They start talking about who's the greatest. They say, absolutely not Jesus, but Jesus needs somebody that gives him some sense that what he is doing is understood. That the self-revelation of God that is going to lead to the cross is at least recognized by some of the faithful. Jesus needs to be fed just like we all do. So Mary comes in and she embarrasses herself. Jaws are not just on the ground, they, they are cl clanking against the ground. Jesus, uh, Mary does four things that brings tremendous shame upon herself, that's so undone, it's just unthinkable. First, she lets her hair down. Now you don't let your hair down outside your bedroom uh, and only in the company of, uh, uh, if it's a man, only in the company of your husband. But she lets her hair down in public. The number one scandal. Number two, she pours oil on another man and then she washes a single man's, touches his feet. This is beyond taboo, touching the feet of a single man in front of all of these people. And then it gets worse, she washes his feet with her hair. The scandal of itself, without even talking about the nard, is monumental. The people there are looking at her saying, what are you doing? Do you have no respect? Do you know who this is? What are you doing? This is at it. What, what's going on? But Jesus understands. Jesus understands, and Jesus not only understands, but Jesus needed this. So what is it that, that, that Mary pours over Jesus' feet? The pure nard, uh, it comes from the Himalayan mountains. So from far, far away from India and, and up near Nepal, and it, between 3,000 and 5,000 feet, uh, this uh, plant grows. And it's the, uh, it's the stem that's below the ground. Uh, that they, what they do is they pull it up and then they, they crush it and process it uh, and, 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 and bleed it so that they get this, this nard. And the nard that they have is about $20,000 worth, 300 days labor, almost a year's labor for what she pours out. It's so pungent and so powerful uh, that they put it into a, a, a container that you actually have to break open so that the smell stays in and so that nobody can take any off the top. This is reserved mainly for royalty or for certainly the highest class. And generally the royalty would have it uh, poured on their head as a sign of their kingship. I looked up a recipe for how to make nard and they said six drops of this nard mixed with a, a quarter cup of coconut oil would make a, a perfectly fine uh, pungent perfume. Uh, so pouring a pound of it, uh, you can only imagine, it even describes it, filling the entire room with aroma. Uh, if you've ever had a daughter put way too much perfume on, uh, you have a sense of what this might have been like. But take it totally undistilled and imagine the entire room just absolutely reeking of this nard. And Jesus thinks to himself, somebody finally understands. Someone finally understands what is on my shoulders, what is in my heart, the weight that I am bearing, where I have to go, and how difficult it is, and how excessive it is to be able to get there. The stained glass window that I come across every time and when I, I go to, uh, the, to talk to the children uh, with Jesus praying in Gethsemane, I think to myself, Mary understood the weight of it all. And like I said, you would put it on a king's head to announce that he's king, but the times where you put it on your extremities is death. Mary was preparing Jesus for his death. But he was, she was doing so in a way that understood the extravagant love that went into what Jesus was about to go through. The excessive love being poured out. And Mary acknowledged that. 
Judas Iscariot tries to shut her down and says, what are you thinking, woman? You can feed 300 poor for that. And knowing that Jesus certainly has a heart for the poor, and, and the church has misunderstood that line for way too long, uh, we'll always have the poor as if that's sort of uh, our way out. Uh, Jesus cared passionately about the poor, and whenever we uh, wash the feet of the poor, whenever we feed the poor, uh, we're doing so to Christ himself. But in this particular moment, Jesus needed more than anything for a prophet like Mary to walk in and say, I understand where you're going. I know what it'll be like. I know what, uh, what you're about to do for all of us. Sure enough, the first verses after this are not just them coming after Jesus, but also saying Lazarus, uh, because he's the evidence of what Jesus has done, uh, will, will need to be killed as well. But in that moment, Jesus has the strength and the fortitude to march forward, to be able to carry on. Uh, and I imagine, just like we have those smells that come and just this light wafts and take us back in time, uh, that the amount of nard that was poured on Jesus didn't quickly go away. That he get whiffs of that as he walked straight from here to Jerusalem, as he prepared that meal with his closest followers and washed their feet. As he prayed in the garden, begging God, if this is your will, let your will be done. But if not, remove this cup from me. Imagine that continued to waft up. And that image of Mary pouring it out gave him the strength that he needed from the cross. As he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Wafts of that filled him as people were jeering. And he needed to know that somebody understood what this was revealing about the God who loves us more than life itself, who pours himself out for us. That the excessiveness wasn't lost. Imagine that smell continued to emulate, emulate and give Give Jesus the strength he needs. Now us, as we get close to the cross, as we continue our journey, as we try to figure out what it is that has been done for us, uh, as we get closer and closer to understanding the love that is revealed in Jesus, the love that is poured out on the cross, the question that we have for us is how, like Mary, do we respond? How do we respond in a way that makes chins hit the ground? How do we respond in a way that tells God we get it? We know how much you love us. We know what was poured out for us. And this is the least we can do to share that love, to continue to be poured out for the world. Amen.